the, uh, none of these people wanted to do this presentation. <laughs> Just be completely honest with you. Uh, but I said, hey, you know, people might have questions for you. They, you know, want to know about new routes on Cedar Rapids Transit, or what's corridor rides, or what's NTS doing with this corridor medical shuttle, and uh, is anything new at lifts? So I asked them all just to you know, spend a couple minutes talking about anything of interest in their particular areas, and then we'll have a, hopefully a few minutes for some questions, and then we'll get ready for lunch. So uh, Brad DeBrower is the manager of Cedar Rapids Transit. You guys can decide what order you go in. Uh, Brock Grenis is uh, the transportation uh, planner for East Central Iowa Council of Governments. Um, Mike Barnhart is the chief operating officer with Horizons and NTS. And Tom Hardikoff is the manager of Lynn County Lifts. So uh, take it away. Um, I'm going first here. So again, Brad Brower, uh, Transit Manager with CRF Transit. And I'm going to go ahead and discuss just what we, the uh, route changes, the schedule changes that we made, uh, just, just a brief overview uh, that took place uh, back in July. Um, we implemented those changes based in part on recommendations that were included in the 2016 uh, Transit Study Conduct by the Quarter of MPL. And I see we have at least one representative here with, uh, with the MPL for anyone in the back. I see Hillary Kirchner as well. Um, so we, they, it was a year-long study really that took place before we made these changes. Um, and uh, we then uh, worked with the MPO, with their consultant, and with, with their recommendations um, to, uh, to fine-tune a few things based on input that we had also received um, during the study, prior to our and after that study. And we then ended up having some additional open houses at the Ground Transportation Center trying to get more input before we finalized those plans. Came down to it was that the change we made um, uh, had to be cost neutral as far as the uh, um, improvements uh, that we were, that, things that we could absorb into our existing budget. Um, the, uh, we didn't have the revenue, um, the additional funding as far as at this stage in our, in our uh, uh, operation to go ahead and really expand service. So the change that we ended up making were, were things that we could absorb. And so we ended up having to reshuffle a lot of the deck chairs as far as making some of these changes work. But uh, one of the things, or a couple of things that we ended up doing was make sure that we didn't have any fare uh, or transit increases. So no tax increases, no, no additional cost to our, our existing passengers. Uh, we continued with our free Saturday service as well. And we did not, unfortunately, have any increase in the span of our service hours. And that's something that we made really clear when we, we talked to our council members as far as all the carrying is that. That's the thing we were allowed to clear the most from our, our, our customers was a desire to see our, our expansion of our service hours. But at this time, we don't have the revenues. We weren't able to do so without having to make some significant trade-offs, um, such as consolidating more routes or eliminating some of our peaks or just do so. So to answer that question, because I expect that question would be one of the things that we would we'll continue to hear is, you know, when if and when something like that could, could occur. And so no promises, but we hope to have some some options for our council to consider during our FY20 or FY21 budget proposals. Um, again, you know, it may be maybe something that uh, uh, we can hopefully pull off in some way, shape, or form. Probably will include some trade-offs, uh, but that is something that we are hoping that we can do some sort of a, a, an expansion or evening service hours at that time. So, uh, as far as the route change that, that actually took place, that study recommended that we focus on our, our higher use routes by increasing frequency and provide bi-directional service where possible. And I didn't want to touch base a little bit on the trade-offs between focusing on, on ridership versus the coverage. That frequency and span of service are critical to passengers, to the passengers um, because it makes frequency makes transit service more convenient. And for people that don't use transit, I try to use the analogy that frequency is, is much like having a gate at the end of a driveway for us on a drive car. And so that that gate closes and it only opens once an hour, your car is not very convenient. If you miss it when that gate opens and closes, you're going to have to wait for that gate to open and close again. So if that gate opens and closes every half hour, more convenient. If it opens and closes every 15 or 20 minutes, even more so. And the same holds true with bus service. The more frequent we have bus service, the more convenient it is for the passenger. 
but that also has trade-offs because more more that game opens and closes, so I've been your driveway, the more costs are involved in it. And that's that holds true across this large frequency. Uh, more buses, we more drivers, more expense. Um, so but we also know that on high service corridors, that's what we need is more frequency because passengers actually, you know, they, they truly need that, that, that initial service. So we are always kind of on a, a trade-off mode. Add more frequency, we don't have additional service, or if we don't have additional revenue to cover that, where does, how do we make that work in a lot of times that's trade-offs? And that's what we end up having to deal with with these uh, changes that we have to make this time around. Um, so our decrease, decrease in frequency, uh, one of the main uh, one of the major emphasis areas that we ended up having was our, our service on First Avenue on the east side between downtown Sea Rapids and Windham Hall. Very much our high chief corridor, and we had 30 minutes service along that, but we increased that frequency to 15 minutes. Uh, and that, that's something that really has, we've already seen an uh, uh, increase in ridership and convenience for, for our passengers along that route. Uh, other changes that we ended up making were. Uh, well, there was a trade out with that we ended up combining routes two and nine into one route um, to make that it, it transfer hours from those two routes on to route five. Uh, we also looked at increase our peak service where we could on our highest ridership routes and in particular in routes that served high schools. And so that was a change that we ended up making. Um, but the other, other change that was in addition to concentrating our service on higher use corridors was the creation of additional transfer locations outside of GTC. Because that was the other comment that we heard was, if I live on the west side, I live on the north side, wherever it may be, why do I have to ride all the way downtown to transfer to get all the way back out that's just you know, a few blocks away to some different route? So one of the things that we ended up working hard to do was to, to come up with some additional transfer locations. And so on the west side, uh, we focus on Westdale and all our locations. Uh, on the east side, we focus on Vendale. So Instead of having just one or two routes serving those locations, we now have multiple routes serving those locations. Um, they don't always, always match up as far as the time transfer, but it does, it has given passengers the opportunity of not having to necessarily ride to the GTC to go ahead and get somewhere that's just a few blocks away on a different route. So we think that that really has been a, has been a positive. Um, the uh, other thing that we ended up doing was we created two new circulator routes, and this was new for our system. In the past, everything was coming out of the GTC and transfer. And uh, uh, we created a, uh, two new routes, routes 20 and 30, and those were both circulated routes that one is on the northeast side, serving Sea Rapids and Iowa, the Baxter Mall, and the other is serving Marion. And uh, um, I, again, something different for us, because uh, everything has come down to GTC before. And I say we've gotten mixed reactions to those changes, um, but most are positive. I'd say probably the 70 30 as far as positive and negative as far as feedback that we're receiving on these, these circulated routes. Um, but uh, uh, for the most part, it has been well received. Um, like I said, I don't know if the, uh, you know, as far as if you, if you uh, utilize the bus or, or, or your clients do, as far as which feedback is really open to hearing about that because as we've made these changes, we will be tweaking things again next summer. Uh, we know we'll have to make a few schedule adjustments. We know that we'll end up having to uh, uh, maybe tweak a few routes here or there, but uh, we'll continue with our public input as far as those recommendations go. You know, and look at the data as far as that we have from our, uh, from our GPS or our mobile or our, our uh, tracking system as far as our ridership uh, is, is actually heavily located as far as our future changes. So, um, really quick overview. Um, we weren't happy to ask questions once the rest of you guys get through, but they want to talk about as well. So, uh, turn the mic over. Thanks. <coughs> I'm Sherrod Chris, and from the East Side Shire Council of Governments, and I'm here to speak for our order rights. A new program our agency has launched that is uh, essentially bringing some new transportation options to our region. And that's what we're going to talk about today, but I'd also like to mention that um, we've housed EC High Transit in our agency, and at this time uh, we're transferring the brand of EC High Transit to also uh, be core rights. So if you're familiar, we have Benton County Transportation, Iowa County Transportation, uh, Jones County Jets, Johnson County Seats, Lincoln County Lifts, and Washington County Minibus. All had been a part of ECI Transit and now we'll uh, be sporting this forward rights brand. You've probably maybe seen some of the buses around Lynn County or even Jones County that have this new branding. Um, still the same service, nothing changes. They have the same phone number, same websites. Uh, we just kind of have a fresh enough to look and um, flash up a little bit. Uh, so, uh, back in 2014, 
the DOT looks at any ways to reduce uh, single occupant cars, their uh, commuters, basically employment related. Uh, specifically looking at the I-3 corridor between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, but also a seven county region, and really eight ways to incorporate these, these types of things throughout the state. So in our region, they identify uh, three easy targets. First being ride sharing, which is a kind of exploitation like carpooling. It's not new and innovative, innovative per se, but a way to attract the riders to, to find carpool matches. A public van pool service, which really operates um, as a way for people to come together with the same origin and destination and use a vehicle that they don't own, but they, they want to use, and an express bus service between Sierra and Iowa City. So uh, I'll not spend too much time on carpooling because people probably are familiar with it. Uh, but essentially, our service is a way to match people that might not otherwise, you know, uh, find matches through their employer or their same areas. Uh, it's a website, so quarterrights.com. We'll take this site. Uh, you see right at the center, finding a community option with the origin and destination. I'll just walk through what you see. Um, it's a free service. I'll, I'll probably point out that um, here's a register page. You don't have to register find matches, but in order to contact those matches, you should find them. That doesn't require you register for free, just to fill out information. <coughs> it's kind of fuzzy, but uh, just there that plugged in between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City, uh, you, you find 35 carpool partners eventually. And once you click on these, they all have a different um, group. They can have different schedules available at the end of the week. Uh, once you find one that can match you, you privately contact them through the site. There's no exchange of personal information um, until you are, are comfortable sharing that. Um, kind of like a Craigslist site, maybe it's hard as. Another service is Vanpool. Um, not a lot of people are familiar with Vanpool. You might have seen University of Iowa vans traveling around here in the big white vans. Uh, it's the same service, just so open to anybody in our uh, seven county region. <coughs> It can be as small as five people, up to 15, and we can provide different vehicles, depending on that size of group. <clears throat> the, the main of it is our program, because the quarter rights will provide a $400 discount to a group um, to use that. And for a limited time, we're actually going to up that to an $800 uh, discount per month for a limited time to try to attract some new vans. Um, the, the average cost of these vans is around $900 to $1,500 a month, and that's just split up between the people. It does require someone to, to volunteer to drive, maybe even a backup driver or two, let that person sick. Um, and we have a, a third party provider to the day to day operation that's enterprise ride share, with an enterprise car in the program. Same folks. Uh, it's kind of neat about the program is, is we can have a nicer vehicle than like a passenger van. So we have these, we picture of a Chevy Traverse here, and they have options available for like Wi Fi or premium upgrades if you're, if you're willing to do that. <clears throat> and lastly, in a guaranteed right home program. Guaranteed right home program. So if you're at your work, you wrote the van, and you need to get home with a sick kid or some other emergency, they will um, take you home either a taxi, an Uber, or you can pick you up. Uh, they only get a couple of those per year, so you can't take advantage of that. <clears throat> uh, coming soon, our express bus service. Still tentatively scheduled to launch of uh, June or July 2018, but it'll go from downtown Cedar Rapids, uh, Southwick Kirkwood Community College, and they designated, I think, 40 or 50 parking spots for people to park for free on the bus. Uh, straight down to the Corbettville Iowa River Landing District, the front door of the University Hospitals, downtown Iowa City, and back. So we'll circulate that pattern uh, from a little before 6 a.m. to about 8 p.m. They have even up to a uh, half hour headway in the, the morning and afternoon peak times and one hour <coughs> the rest of the day. So that summarizes my presentation. I'm going to take a question after we all have a chance to talk. I'm Mike Barnhart, the CEO uh, at uh, Horizons and Family Service Alliance. Uh, I've run NTS for the past 17 years as well. We merged with Horizons two years ago. So. The, the different title. And for those of you that don't know, NTS provides rides at night and on weekends to school and work when the buses don't run. I run the opposite hours of uh, Tom and Brad there. So we start at 6.30 at night, run until 6 in the morning, 
Monday through Friday. We run a little bit later on Saturday because the buses don't start until 9. We run until 8. And we run all day Sunday until 6 o'clock in the morning. <coughs> Excuse me, Monday morning. Uh, our service area is the cities of Cedar Rapids, Hiawatha, and Marion. Uh, the cost is $6 a ride. And uh, to sign up for the rides, you would come down to our office, located across from Boston Fish, and uh, I gotta remember the address now, 815, is it? 819. 819, 5th Street, Southeast. Um, and as I said, $6 a ride. We're funded through the city of Cedar Rapids. Hiawatha gives us a little money, Mary gives us a little money, and uh, uh, United Way as well. And just a couple things about the folks who use our service. 82% uh, of the people who use our service are below the federal poverty level. And remember, all, almost all of our rides are to work. So uh, these are folks, another 80% report they have no other means of transportation to get to work. So it's an important uh, service. I'm sure we all can agree that transportation should be a, a reason for people not to get to work. So we provide a valuable service. I'm afraid to say the other things we do here with uh, after Cheryl's presentation, but. We do have a Florida medical shuttle that runs down to Iowa City three days a week, and I do have marketing brochures on the table back there <laughs> if anybody wants more information. But it runs Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. Uh, I don't know the exact time, but three times a day, like 8 in the morning, noon, and 4 in the afternoon if you want more information. Again, my illegal marketing <laughs> brochures are back on the, the table back there. And there's a number of other things we do in the community here. We um, we uh, work uh, transportation for the uh, homeless overflow shuttles in the winter time. We've done some rides for uh, homeless kids to schools, work with uh, pretty much every nonprofit in the community at one time or another to, to assist getting people where they need to go. And again, I'll answer any questions after the presentation is done. Tom was last year, and I really like the new logo on the buses. Tom was really sharp. Well, we can thank Brock for the new logo. He stayed up one night late and figured that out, so that really helps out. Um, yeah, that's one of the good things that we're coming up with. Uh, so I'll set up my challenges first. We'll tag on to Brock there with the corridor rides. I think that's going to give us a more uh, fluent brand, uh, a better strategy for the area because everybody's buses are kind of plain vanilla. They look like all the hotel buses, all the care center buses. And now we have our buses that are unique. Um, and the closest thing to them is uh, to the rescue. And I think that uh, the lettering is different. So you guys don't, don't stand out there so much. OK, challenges for Lynn County Lifts. And for those of you who don't know, I'm sure most of you do know, we have the ADA paratransit provider uh, contracted with the city of Cedar Rapids. We also provide rides in rural Lynn County uh, as best we're able for, for public transit. Um, Challenges, and just very briefly, uh, the challenges we see out on the horizon, and again, we're, we're not looking at that 50 year window that Dan is, but relatively quickly, um, I'm getting older. And everybody that's my same age is getting older. And we're going to need more services, and I expect you guys out there younger than me to provide those for us. But how is that going to happen? Because we're challenged now in resources and availability, and so it's going to be a real it's going to be something that's going to be a change. It's going to be a radical change, a societal change. I think that's what Dan was alluding to, that you know, we think we have to own cars, but we don't have to. Society is going to change. And I think we're going to see those changes coming. We'll be forced to as, as I get older and I need more services from you young kids. Uh, we're, we're going to see that. Uh, Chris is going to talk later about the integrated settings rules. So, you know, that, that's got me a little bit shaking in my office chair because how are we going to when we're already strapped for resources to provide more individual rides or more individual homes to more individual job sites and not that it's not a needed and necessary thing but the integrated settings rule has a little bit of uh, trepidation for us uh, and i know in funding issues um, not only transportation related but all through the whole federal trickle down economy theory you see that the federal government is putting more and more of a burden on local resources for many, many, many programs, not just transportation. But we see that in the transportation field that uh, it's, it's very much more difficult to access funds than we would like it to be. Um, and it's not because of anything that 
is a is a choice. It's just part of where we're at right now. Um, but on the positive side, as we said, we have a new new brand, new logo. Thank you, Brock. Thank you, everybody who's part of that program. I think the new OTI part of that too is is really amazing. Uh, from an internal perspective, uh, my staff is improving, and I think that with a couple of changes we see for coming up with our staff in the next couple of years, we're going to be able to get some uh, really good improvements in there to have better service for our people, take better care of our clients. Uh, the county is embarking on a customer-centered culture, which is kind of strange for a government to be thinking about their customers. Um, but we're going to start thinking, we're not going to start, we're going to improve our thoughts on our customers and what we can do, how we can serve the customer, not just uh, for example, the treasurer, not just that you have to come there and pay your property taxes twice a year and we could give a rip how that happens. We're going to instead try to figure out how to make that a better process for the clients because everybody's a customer. Um, good news, bad news. For years I've been sitting up here crying about my vehicles and I can see through the floorboard of them. And uh, we're running with no air in the tires. Well, over 50% of our buses are now seven years old or older. Seven years is the oldest bus that the Federal Transit says we should be able to run. After that, they're supposed to be retired and replaced. Funding is not there for that. But just two years ago, we were 65% older than seven years. And we have more on the horizon coming very quickly. So our individual fleet is gonna be in the best shape it's been for at least 10 to 15 years in the very near future. That is partly due to Kristen writing a check for the DOT, and we really appreciate the DOT's participation with getting the funding distributed, and partly because the city of Cedar Rapids, who gets beat up a lot, has decided and challenged their budget, and they're actually buying buses out of local funds. That's not something that happens very often. Um, that's, it's really quite unheard of without federal participation. And that's because we realize, again, this federal money is not coming in at the same rate that we need it. So we're going to be in very good shape as far as us. We're very fortunate to be in this position at this point. And Brad's worked a lot of years to get over that hump with uh, what he was left. And he inherited the place to get a decent fleet, so good job there. That, yes, absolutely. The MPO has been a big part of that, funding up. Uh, and oncoming funding starting 2020 is going to be quite a bit different than what we've seen in the past from the MPO. So, yes, thank you, Brad, and, and thank you, Brandon, and the MPO, because that is a big part of this. Um, but last and not least, our best thing that's happened at Lynn County Lips is we now have a mobility coordinator housed within our department. And that is good because the area now can avail themselves of Terry's expertise and it's no longer a year-to-year -year funded position. The Board of Supervisors has made this a permanent position within the county, and Terry's doing some wonderful, wonderful things for us, and he's just now starting to really get that bicycle going at top speed. So you're going to see some good stuff coming in the next couple of years with coordination and with mobility coordination. So thank you, Terry. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I didn't have to pay him all that much for that. It was surprising. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions for any of these gentlemen? Or Tom? <laughs> so I was just curious if you could each walk through and just provide the top. So just one example of your biggest pain point that your organization and system has for moving people from point A to B. Hopefully that's not too complicated your way. I want a minute to think about that. <laughs> Should have been a politician. I would say it's the, I think we probably all going to say we have, you know, the restraints that we have or the constraints that we have as far as financing because we would all like to look for more service out there. But it's in our situation as we look at what they can change with the strength of the study and the implementation of all those changes, the trade-offs that we have to make with um, we we took service away from a low use neighborhood because it was low use and put those hours and those vehicles onto a high use corridor. Very much a you know, or mass transit, not individual transit, at least my, my perspective of it, of it is. And it only makes sense for us to put 
with those resources, limited resources where we're going to get the most back from our But we also know that we're impacting. There's always, there's always someone that's, you might be a little, little rider's carry, but there's still people that utilize that service that we're no longer serving. Um, and so that's a big pain point that we know we can't be able to make all people. Um, and we got to go ahead and make those sometimes difficult recommendations and, and decisions uh, when we have to make those changes. I'll speak maybe to more of the rural areas we serve is that you know, few part, there's not always a recognition that our services are available or people realize that they are. Um, but sometimes that they are, and we don't have the resources and the staff and drivers and buses to, to accommodate every single request. That's a funding and uh, more recent phenomenon is just finding good quality drivers. Uh, it didn't used to be an issue for me for the last few years. That's really become an issue. So I'd say that it's the unique trips we would we would have a request for. A uh, necessary trip, something that's absolutely needed, it's not within our mission, and yet I don't have the resources just to go out there and provide that service, either a one-off time or constantly. So uh, again, three out of four of us immediately said, well, I think all of us said resources. Um, resources equals money. But uh, and you wish you could do more, and sometimes you just can't. Other questions? Oh, coming. Um, I, I have a question, and it, it goes to um, Dennis Rock. Rock you. Um, are you are those corridor buses? Are they going to be accessible to just people? Yeah, they will be. Um, they will both be. the ones that go between Sierra and Iowa City will be. And then uh, the van poles, if there's a group that forms with the need for a, a, a wheelchair ramp, for example, that will be accommodated. So how long do you go? I would see you. The, the service, when it starts between Sierra and Iowa City, um, every hour they will be at the stop, and then during the morning and afternoon. Yep, just Monday through Friday. If there is the corridor medical show that goes down three days a week right now, and there's brochures back there if you want the exact times and how to schedule and things, and that is accessible, it is operating now. Okay, um, looking at and listening to you guys and stuff, it sounds like corridor rides is maybe most um, advanced towards trying to attract middle class clients. And otherwise, right now, Uber and Lyft are really taking away a lot of night service. If people are choosing to go out and drink and take a ride home, um, you can really be expanding customer service base, and then you'll know if you are able to provide those night services. And in the case of um, MTS, there's a bit of a boundary there because you need to be pre-signed up, and I don't think it's really set up to just be a kind of tax play. Um, so do you guys have any strategies and plans to try and reach out and make it more mainstream for middle class to start utilizing this public transit? Um, I can speak for the nighttime service. It's it's really a different type of ride, giving somebody a ride to work and picking somebody up at a bar. And that's just our niche. You know, not that that would be the only ride. It's even different. It's speaking about medical rides. People don't think. It's just a totally different kind of ride if you're picking somebody up to go to work. You have an expectation that they're like ready to get there. They have to be there at a certain time. There's just a lot of parameters. Not that it can't be done, but it is a different kind of ride. Even that with a, a medical ride or if you're going to ride to uh, somebody who's elderly that you may have to assist. It's just a, a, a different type of ride. But I don't see us moving into competing with Uber or Lyft in those types of rides, but I do see us moving into a more customer-friendly type of, you know, on-demand type ride for the rides that we, we do. And I would say I'd love to have middle class, class riders from which are and use your service. Well, I don't think that we're ever going to be in a position in which we can compete with or more. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's folks that do need the door door service as far as for what's that? Price can. Well, but it's... Right, but and, and that's what we focus on is that, you know, as far as the, the, the higher use corridor, as far as the picture service. We do what we do want to see some, some service 
expansion of the uni. Um, but it all comes down to we don't have additional funding, more trade offs, you know, where we where we end up um, cutting other areas that make that work. But I, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to compete with some of that once that door to door pickup um, uh, as far as the big shop losses goes. Well I actually have probably a few things because I am someone who both has utilized the bus services, I use them since I was four years old. Um, and also work with other people who utilize the services. Um, so I, I actually, sorry, um, I, I actually been really appreciative of kind of some of the changes with the um, routes that actually made it. I know with like the J Street apartments, which is a lower income area, um, there's two places that are, are easy to access, so it's easier to get downtown now instead of having to wait on the bus the whole time. And it is also easier to get out to the stores and stuff on that side of town. Um, one of the more difficult things, though, is if uh, parents or students have extracurricular activities with them being prairie district, it makes it very complicated. And that's a very specific issue. It's just something that I've noticed while not being doors for local campaigns. Um, and I, I do appreciate the extra route five because. It, it makes it easier to be able to go to the Lindale Mall or that area where my daughter actually goes to Johnson. And so the bus times don't quite meet up for Route, is it two that's still out there? We yeah, have Route two um, because of the change in the bus times and the change in the school times. Um, one of the complaints that I have gotten is that um, some of the people with the changes have been really confused and it's more difficult for them to understand some of the changes, especially with the circulator route. Some people have gotten kind of confused with how those work specifically. Um, and I, I've heard a couple of stories where people getting on the wrong bus or, or whatever like that. Um, and, and I do understand that you guys are, are kind of, you have a lot of constraints with the finances in it. I, I am kind of one of those like middle class writers who, who is using the bus probably a little bit more now but that's because I grew up on the bus. Um, and then the other, I had one question that's more specific to clients because a lot of clients get the bus tickets, the blue bus tickets. Um, and because of like how the routes are transferred, a lot of people are using them quicker so it's harder for them to get around where it lasts the most time. But there's not a lot of resources in the area that actually are able to provide the bus tickets. And then the second one was actually regarding NTS and to see if there's um, any effort on kind of making it a little bit easier with getting to workplaces closer to the time. Because like I have a coworker who uses NTS and would have to start a shift at 11 and gets to their job at 9. And that creates a big barrier. Um, Yes, I would like to do it. And there's a guy down in Georgia that has a, 
a system that it, it's kind of like Lyft or uh, Uber for nonprofits. And I just haven't had a chance to really connect with them on how that would be. But I'd love to do that. And uh, you know, but you don't want to exclude, exclude people that don't have a smartphone or don't have a credit card either. So you kind of need to have both so you can keep everybody in the system. But it's a great idea. I'd love to do it. It's not the same thing, I don't think, that you're asking, but you know, we do, for the big trial sign, we do have our ride CRT app. So passengers can actually see where the buses are and when it's expected to be arriving, estimated you know, So they aren't hopefully having to go off to a bus stop and waiting for 45 minutes when they can look at their smartphone on the app and realize I can walk out five minutes before the bus arrives and catch the bus. The other thing we're looking to do, and, and we're exploring this, I hope hopefully we can go and get something implemented in the next year here, um, is the use of selling our tickets over the smartphone. Um, you know, right now we are, you, you buy your tickets on the GTC, um, it's, it's just the way the system is set up right now. But we are hoping, so spending half a million dollars on a new pair of boxes, and that might be outdated in a couple years from now, um, because we can use those dollars for us instead. Uh, we're hoping that well, there's, there are several vendors out there that have the technology available for us to go ahead and utilize, so we can allow passengers to go ahead and buy their tickets over the smartphone and then we'll keep track of the usage of that uh, during the smartphone as well. Um, so that's something that we're all to, to add on here for next year or so. This is going to be our last question before we break for lunch. And it, it hardly comes to the question, it's more an appreciation of the route-based service that you guys provide as opposed to the point-to-point -point type service that people are asking about. I, I think you guys do a great job of building route-based service that follows the standard route that addresses as many people as possible. And, and what many have difficulty understanding is, as you move to point to point type service, the costs become uh, infinitely more expensive. Uh, if you're addressing many people, uh, as a route-based service does, your costs can go down because you're, you're uh, grabbing a larger bucket. And so uh, even though these groups can uh, bend closer to that point to point type service, getting to an actual cash, we can pick somebody up at this time, take them from this bar to their home. Um, they, they can't really set it up as a point-to-point -point service and uh, remain cost-effective. One of the things I, I look at as well, so I look at the or Uber or other transportation modes as our competitors. And we're in the mobility business, and so we see that as, you know, we're trying to, some of these are trying to go ahead and get high ridership areas. Knowing that we can't be all things, that's why we have air transit services, that's why we have NTS, and we have the other, you know, we have we have the private uh, nonprofits that put that are providing service that we can't provide. So we don't see that, uh, you know, uh, uh, competing with these other services that you all are providing as well. Um, because you know, oftentimes you talk about you know, that last mile, trying to get to, you know, sort of that last mile, because there are certain obviously there are passengers that need that door door pickup that we can't provide. Um, and I see these services, you know, whether it be a taxi service or a uh, great taxi, which you know, we're with our, um, they're not competitors, they're, they're our cooperators, you know, so um, I mean, we see that as a, a niche that they're providing that we can't. Thank you all very much. Uh, could you give a round of applause to our panelists? Okay, we're obviously